What happens when an institution transcends the transactional to become transformational? How can an organization help serve as a bridge between a county's urban center and its rural communities? And what happens when a community foundation purchases and renovates a former grocery store to create a hub for nonprofits, a one-stop shop for residents to connect to the resources they need? Hello and welcome to a special Our Town Civic Foundation conversation. I'm Ben Spagan. I'm the editorial director at Our Towns. Here in a conversation with folks from the Finley Hancock County Community Foundation, we'll explore the answers to those questions. Joining me are Brian Treese, the president and CEO of the foundation, where he provides leadership and direction in fulfilling and advancing the mission of the organization and also serves in the role of dad to an amazing four-year-old daughter. Welcome, Brian. Thank you. Jenna Freed, the communications director of the foundation. In her role, she is responsible for the overall strategic direction of the community foundation's communications and works to build an understanding of the foundation in its mission, its vision, and its values. She's been with the foundation for eight years and is a mom to a three-year-old. In her spare time, you can find her reading, swimming, and spending time on or near Lake Erie. Welcome, Jenna. Hello. And Kimberly Bash, the Chief Community Engagement Officer. She joined the Community Foundation in May 2002, initially leading a K-16 youth philanthropy and service learning partnership that was a model program for Ohio. In her current role, she oversees responsive grant making and community engagement activities and has helped lead Hancock County efforts toward coalition building and collective impact initiatives, working to create lasting solutions to complex social problems. Kimberly is also a proud aunt to 10 nieces and nephews, and is a devoted Ohio State Buckeye fan, which, having Ohio State Buckeye fans in my family, I can't help but want to say OH to get that I-O response. Kimberly, uh, I-O. welcome. <laughs> welcome. <laughs> welcome. Welcome. And welcome, I'm, and welcome, I'm rep- welcome. representing as well as I can today, Scarlet and Gray. <laughs> Terrific. And uh, so go Buckeyes, go Finley Hancock Community Foundation. Let's dive into the issues. And Kimberly, I want to stick with you um, because I, I want to talk about uh, both your current role, but also those 21 years. Coming up in May, you'll be celebrating 21 years with the foundation. So I'd like to start with you to talk about some of the changes and the evolution that you've seen over the years to get us to where you and the foundation are today. Oh, Ben, I'll I'll share anything you want me to, but I was under the impression since it was uh, 21 years this May that this was a feature on uh, child prodigies and, uh, you know. It how, is. You, you, how, you yeah. started at the, you started at the, the right the age, age of three, of right? The age of three. Yes, mm-hmm, yes, mm-hmm. exactly. Uh, yeah, so. No, but, uh, you know, it's it's been such a, a blessing to have been in this role or been with a foundation for that length of time um, and to see the work and the transition o- over those years here here in um, my home community. This is where I'm from. I uh, grew up right here in, in Finley Hancock County area. And so, yeah, I think um, over the time frame, um, it, it, it's been crazy as we've increased our dollars you know, and in and, and the amount that we've had in the endowment, um, which of course has allowed us to broaden our impact and the type of work that we get involved with. So as we have increased our unrestricted, you know, dollars coming in, that allows us to think um, a bit more and vision and dream a bit more, um, work with community partners a bit more on what, what is needed um, and gives us that flexibility um, to, um, to be nimble, to, uh, to be, you know, proactive and to, to do more, um, because things change over time. And when I think about how it was, you know, 20 years ago, of course, always wanting to make an impact and work with our donors and our community partners, but that expansion of our endowment, especially in the areas of unrestricted and field of interest have allowed us to do more community leadership work. You know, so really taking a look at those priority areas, um, doing data collection, listening to our residents. It's so important for us to be boots on the ground with our partners and understand what those needs are, um, what matters most, um, and think about how creatively we can adapt our work um, to make the biggest impact over time, helping co-create some of those solutions with the partners. So I think for me, the, the biggest change over the time is that increase in our dollars and how that has allowed us to do um, more community leadership work um, and make and, and, a, a bigger impact. 
And, and even in just round number sense, what has that increase looked like over time, Kimberly? Yeah. So when I came in, um, our endowment was about 25 million. Um, and then <laughs> it was just crazy. I think it was around 2005, maybe. Um, we had a donor, um, grew up right here in Hancock County, but uh, hadn't lived here for, for decades. Uh, Madeline Schneider, God bless Natalie, Madeline Schneider, um, our single largest unrestricted gift. She took our endowment from 25 million to 50 million overnight, um, fully unrestricted her gift was. And so that was a game changer. And I, if I would say there was one change, um, kind of pivot point, uh, that would probably it be it. Um, uh, there's been so many over the years, but that really overnight changed who we could be for our community. And, 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 you know, I'm sure those listening in or watching, um, you know, have, have thought about, heard about, uh, interacted with foundations before, but, you know, just, just plainly put, you know, the unrestricted gifts are something that the foundation can direct toward various different initiatives as opposed to restrictive saying, you know, I want to donate toward a specific cause that is near and dear. Maybe it's education, maybe it's um, uh, homelessness prevention, you know, something like that. But that's quite a bit of cash injection there to, to more than double the endowment overnight. Brian, I want to come to you and ask what sure. the average day in the life of a president and CEO of the Finley Hancock Community Foundation looks like. What does this look like for you? The average life uh, day in the life of Brian? Sure. Well, I think it's important to note that every community foundation, while we have some similarities, and the biggest similarity is that we serve some sort of geographic region, uh, I heard a phrase, if you've seen a community foundation, you've seen one community foundation, and we each approach our work in a different way. And I think that's really important to to set that out really early, uh, because what works for Finley Hancock County may not work for another community. And we have learned so much from our peers at other community foundations. When I think about a day in the life, uh, it, from, from my seat, it can look different and it does look different every single day. So there are some days where I'm meeting with donors to help uh, grow our number of funds or grow gifts to the foundation. Other days I'll be working with the community engagement piece where we look at how can we align our grant making and our community leadership to have the greatest impact on the things that matter most. Uh, what I find most invigorating about our work is that no matter who you talk to at the foundation, each of us has one purpose in mind, which is to improve the quality of life for all in the community. So you gather a team together that um, technically incredibly knowledgeable, but also have this passion for the people in a community that so many of us call home. And so many of us have long, deep roots in this community. And that idea that every day we get to go to work and do whatever we can to make sure tomorrow is better than today for so many people in our community. And that's powerful. And yes, there's administrative details that we have to do. There's budgeting, there's all this paperworky stuff. But at the end of the day, we each, our roles exist to help make tomorrow better for our community. And that's incredibly powerful. And every day that gives me energy uh, because you mentioned my other roles being a dad. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to do whatever I can to make sure tomorrow's better, not just for my daughter, um, but for all the young people in our community. And, and, I, and I think that it, it's it's wonderful that simultaneously both can be true, that every day is the same because of that overarching mission, yet every day can be different because of the ways that you're working to meet that mission, the needs that arise that are of the moment of the now, and, and those that you've been working on for months, if not years. Jenna, I want to turn to you. You were in media before you joined the foundation. What called you to this work? What's the average day in the life of, of Jenna like? So being in a small media market is definitely um, a unique situation that required um, a lot of downtime to be dedicated toward work. And that wasn't something that I could see myself sustaining, but it was really important to me because I also grew up here. Um, this is my hometown that I do something that was equally as connected to the community. Um, I, I was worried when I made the shift that I wouldn't be as involved or as in touch. And uh, neither of those things are true. I would argue that I may be more in touch now and more involved. Um, 
but a day in the life as a communications director is frankly a lot of meetings. Um, I have a 1.5 person team. So I'm meeting with the donor engagement team. I'm meeting with the community engagement team, trying to figure out what's going on around the office um, and what stories I might be able to uh, pull out of all of those different meetings to share the work that we're doing. Um, and beyond that, it's just a lot of creative time doing, you know, video editing, working on our next mailing, um, there's a lot to be done. And then like Brian said, um, I, I also have a toddler at home. So <laughs> my out of office time is pretty much dedicated to her. And, and so Jenna, I, I am in no way doubting your skills, capability and aptitude, but you, you don't strike me as one and a half people. So, so how does this break down? Are you three quarters of a person <laughs> and you have a three quarters counterpart? Are you one and you have a half? What does your team look like? I am one. So I am one and I have um, an excellent counterpart who is part time. We share her with the finance department, which is a, a pretty unique setup um, for someone to do both communications and finance. But uh, similar to Kimberly, she has been here for 15 years. So she has so much institutional knowledge. She was my predecessor um, and having her on my team to do uh, some of the creative work around our website and our social media is just the biggest blessing. She's amazing. I, 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 what a blessing, because that, that's a bit of a unicorn position, right? Somebody that's, mm -hmm. you know, as skilled in uh, Excel as they might be in Canva and being For able sure. to do communications and finance. So um, what a blessing. And, yep. and you all are a, 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 a nimble but mighty team of, you know, some 13 or, or 14 you have, but you three, and, and Jenna, I'm picking up on this, and I, Kimberly, I want to turn to you. Um, you all three are natives of, of the area. So for somebody that's yet to visit Finley or Hancock County, what do you tell them uh, about the place that you call home, Kimberly? You know, I think that this comes up so often in conversation, whether it be inside or outside of the office, um, people have lived in multiple places. You know, they have experience, um, whether it be other places in Ohio or the country, beyond, abroad. Um, and the thing I hear over and over and over again um, that makes Finley and Hancock County so special are the relationships. We we get things done. We we um we put the um the pride aside, um, and, and, and we just dig in and, and, and we do it together and our relationships are so special and the collaboration with those relationships is so special, um, that I do think that that makes us very unique. Um, it makes the work that we do here at the foundation go that much farther because it allows us to quickly connect with those that can make things happen. And it can help us connect with those that we can leverage other dollars for. We know that our dollars aren't going to be able to solve all of these problems. We have got to partner um, with other funders and, and, and those then doing the work. Um, and because of those deep relationships, that trust and those collaborations that, that exist, um, that makes it possible. And, and Kimberly, I want to get into trust in a minute. Before I do, Jenna, I want to give you a chance to say what you tell somebody that's yet to visit, you know, where you live. You you spend time uh, in or near Lake Erie. What do you tell people about Finley Hancock? So we're just unique in that we're a small community surrounded by some of the larger communities. You know, we're somewhere between Toledo and Columbus. Um, we might not have Target, but we do have a super generous, special community where we live. And there's just like Kimberly said, the relationships are, I think, really what make Finley um, as unique as it is. Some of the the things that we've been able to do on what may seem like such a small scale that have really changed the landscape um, of our community, thinking about like some of the imp impactful projects that I know that we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, they're you could see them in some of the larger metropolitan communities, but to see them in Finley is uh, probably a surprise to a lot of people. Can and, I, and Brian, yeah, Brian, I was going to get, I, yeah. I, I want to hear from you. So people listening might think that it's like this Pollyanna community. I also want to point out the reality that uh, there is an awareness of the challenges that face our community. 
Um, and, and how we see that show up is when we look at the community health assessment, when we look at some of our community listening, when we look at strategic planning at the city and county level, there is an awareness and a consensus on those biggest challenges facing our community. So housing, lack of public transportation, workforce, financial stability, harmful substance use and addiction and mental health, all of those areas, there is an alignment uh, in an agreement that yes, you look at every every group that does some sort of study, and they're all pointing to the same things, and and there are collaborations then built around. We know addiction is something that's that's hitting our community hard. How can to Kimberly's point, we rally around and hopefully change some of the metrics? Um, so yes, all of these wonderful things and an awareness that the biggest challenges that we need to come together and address as a community. Yeah, and, and full disclosure, I've not yet been to, to Finley and, and to Hancock County. And, and I look forward to when I, I, I get the day to, to, to visit, but from the outside looking in, hearing what you're saying and, and learning about your community, um, you know, Brian, I want to stick with you because in, in my experience, I, I've seen foundations that either tend to lean more toward being transactional, you know, and, and helping to support communities in that way and, and, and grant dollars out to recipients. And I've seen foundations that are transformational. They take the transformational approach in the community. I, from the 3000 foot view, see the work y'all are doing as transformational, that you're the latter, you're, you're transforming role of connector. Brian, tell me a bit about the ethos of the foundation, your approach, your work in the place that you call home? Well, that's first, that's very kind of you. Um, when we think about our work, one of our, one of our ideas is to be the preferred partner or a preferred partner. So when we think about our role, it's as a connector. And we are so fortunate that our foundation this year will be 31 years old. Um, so young, enough in the in the big scheme of things compared to some of the larger uh, foundations like the Cleveland and Columbus Foundation. Um, young in that perspective, but also um, seasoned enough that we have a bit of a track record. And so we are so thankful for all of those, our, our founders who years and years ago from our founding do donor of um, Dorney, LDL Dorney, uh, all those board members, all those volunteers, all of the donors that have really helped set the course, um, each of us, regardless of when we entered the foundation, inherited an organization that already had some trust built, already had deep relationships. And so we every day just make the conscious decision to focus on our mission and focus on doing our mission really well. And, and our mission is uh, improve the quality of life for all in the community. And it's important when you think about quality of life to recognize that one of the reasons we focus on different things is quality of life shows up in different ways for different people. Um, for some, quality of life is making sure basic needs are met. Housing, food security, um, clothing, very, very, those basic, if you're looking at a hierarchy of needs, those basic needs we also know that for some, it means exposure to the arts or exposure to leisure activities. For some, it means beautification or, or enrichment, making sure that the, the place that they call home is beautiful. Um, so we are able to focus on all of those things because our mission really can be interpreted different ways by different people. And so we often ask that question, what does quality of life mean to you? So we can make sure when we look at the whole continu continuum of quality of life, we're checking the boxes that matter most to the citizens here. So I heard quality of life several times, but I also heard the T word several times, trust. And Jen, I want to come back to you in, in communications. What do those conversations look like to, one, maintain that trust uh, that you all are, are building on from those that came before you, but then to build trust with new people? What does that look like in, in conversation? Sure. So we're, I, I say all the time that we're in the business of relationships and thinking about any relationship you have with anyone in your life, it's, uh, it comes down to communication, to being as transparent as possible, to ensuring that whatever audience you're talking to, you are fulfilling their needs. Um, and it's certainly not a one-way street, um, 
the work that we do in the community, it's it's super important that we hear the feedback from the residents of Finley and Hancock County and that we're both supplying them with the information that they may be seeking, but also talking about our impact, talking about um, how the $75 million that we've put into the community in our 31 years has made a difference. Um, and like, you know, looking around downtown, we can we can point to different projects that we've done looking around the entire community. Um, you know, we're on our fourth heart and soul town now like that. That's a major investment that we've made in Hancock County. Um, so it, it's really just about keeping those keeping those roads open so that they know that they can approach us with questions and comments um, and also being sure that we're supplying the information um, that residents might be seeking. And, and, and Jenna, you mentioned heart and soul, and and this is now the the fourth town you're you're helping support this with. Brian, I want to I want to go back to you here for a second. What made one? What is community heart and soul to you? Two? What made that an attractive model that you were interested in, and now you're on to your fourth community? Sure. So when we think about years ago, when we when we were looking at our grant making, um, you see in our name Finley Dash Hancock County. We represent our whole county. So years years ago, probably at this point, ten plus years ago, we were looking at where our grants were going, and a, a large majority of them were going specifically to Finley. And if you look at population wise, we're about half city of Finley, half outside the city of Finley. So we realized we could do better. And so one, a former employee met somebody from the Orton Family Foundation and heard about this uh, Heart and Soul program, which is now known as Community Heart and Soul. And if you boil it all down, it's, it's a values-based strategic planning process. Um, so we explored it for several years before deciding we were the first partner uh, with the Orton Family Foundation at that point to bring this uh, to a community. Previously, they had done all of the work. We were the first time, we were the first guinea pig that said, I think this has value. And so now, like you mentioned, we are on our fourth community. And to really quickly, or as quick as possible, summarize what it is, we know the the data shows that small towns uh, are changing throughout the United States. When we talk to folks in our community, they talk about the days where they never left their small town, where there was a hardware store, a beauty shop, a grocery store, a gas station. They never needed to leave. Uh, but now things have changed. Downtowns look different. Uh, the number of employers looks different. And, and change is really difficult even in the best of circumstances. So what, what Community Heart and Soul does is first they get this core team together to look at who lives in a community. Diving into the demographics of a community, diving into all of the different corners of a community to see who actually lives here. Uh, the second part is getting everyone involved, talking to every single person in the community. And from, from that, you talk about what are those shared values or what are those shared uh, things that matter in the community. Is it the parks and the pool? Is it the school? Is it supporting a vibrant downtown? Is it local economy? And the whole community then agrees upon whatever those handful of heart and soul statements are. Then you talk about, okay, in the future, if we did nothing, what would it look like? And then you can compare that to in 10 or 20 years, what do we want it to look like? So looking at the parks or recreation example, if we do nothing, what are the parks going to look like in 10 or 20 years? Where do we want them to look? And then how do we fill that gap? And from there, they develop this robust plan. And so, gosh, when we think about what we've seen in the, in the communities that, uh, that we've worked with, you see an increased amount of pride. You see incredible citizen engagement. Uh, and quite selfishly for the foundation then, we know the community better than we ever have before. Um, and there are lots of examples of, of how that's played out, but that idea that we know the people in a community um, is, is really is important. And we've seen some really powerful results. Yeah. 
And, and I, I want to hold on to that, how you get to know the community. And Kimberly, I want to come to you is, is community engagement, you know, what that looks like having those conversations. But, you know, I, again, uh, Brian, one of the points I, I appreciate you bringing up is, you know, the, this gives towns an opportunity to look at what they care about. And, and our towns has been reporting on the heart and soul, uh, community heart and soul, and, and they've been a supporter and partner of our work. And we've seen from town to town you see some of the universal themes. People care about education. People care about parks. People care about the arts. They care about safety. But what's interesting is to see the process play out of how it goes from the general to the specific. How do you care about your park? How do you care about your block? How do you care about safety in your community? What that looks like with that engagement, getting people involved in, in, in engaging in the story gathering process that happens during Community Heart and Soul, but getting to know, as Brian said, the community better, you know, from the foundation standpoint. Kimberly, what do those conversations look like? Uh, what is it like being that dash, that 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 bridge between Finley, the urban and urban core, and then Hancock, more rural parts of, of your community? What's it been like being the dash? I think... You know, one of the things coming back to the fact that we're all from Hancock County has um, has been really important in that process because, um, you know, starting as young kiddos and those relationships that you develop over the years um, that you can then lean in on um, to help make a connection um, or nurture and, you know, and grow. Um, when I first started here um, in my work, uh, probably um, outside of Finley, the closest relationships that we had were with the schools, um, with that, you know, youth kind of focus that we were having. So, you know, those relationships then can continue to, to deepen over the years, which allowed us, again, another foothold into those communities. Um, different donors that might have been out there um, that we could connect with. Um, so I think just over the years, it's about relying on and intentionally nurturing those um, those relationships um, and then being intentional about going, being being there, you know, going to where they are at and, and talking to them. What's going on in Mount Blanchard? What's happening or what do you hope might be coming down the pike that are opportunities maybe for investment or that we can, because of our relationships, help be a connector to resources or service providers um, in the Finley area that could benefit you, know, you out in the rural area. So it's really about listening um, and, and then saying, okay, you know, we have, I think, a really unique um, position in, in, in our community and that we have the luxury to uh, sit back, dream a bit, vision a bit, understand best practices and what's going on in other communities where those people that are living it every day don't necessarily have that luxury. And so we can make those connections in best practices. We can make those connections and providers here in Finley um, that are looking to expand as well. I think it's so exciting for me when I took talk to um, nonprofits, um, funders um, that again are mostly housed here in Finley, but they too say, we want to do better. We want to do more also. We're just not sure how, you know, so, so do you have a connection um, we, we would love for you um, to make that connection for us so that we can find out how we can do more. Um, and that just warms your heart because it's not just us. That's yes, it's like, that's our mantra. That's what we talk about every single day. Um, but there's so many of our partners here in Finley that feel the same, but they're just not sure where to start. So I think just with those relationships, with those connections, with listening deeply, um, we can do better over time. Can I give a quick example of that? Um, so one of the heart and soul communities was Mount Blanchard. Mm -hmm. And Mount Blanchard wrapped up community heart and soul right before the pandemic. So when when needs were coming or being identified left and right, um, how this really looked in real life, we had a, a local nonprofit uh, that works with mental health and counseling want to do a pilot to try to get make sure that mental health services were provided in the in the rural communities. Well, we knew in Mount Blanchard which community leaders had a passion for mental health and which were 
which were the best connectors. So we could connect that nonprofit, not with general community leaders, but those couple of people who we knew cared so deeply about mm -hmm. mental health that they could help make it happen. Um, where had we not done community heart and soul, we wouldn't necessarily know who those folks were. Um, also during the pandemic, food security came up. And again, using Mount Blanchard as an example, they learned so much about poverty and deep poverty in their community and were surprised like many communities at what those numbers actually are. And so when the pandemic started, uh, they really rallied around that idea of looking at the needs in the community and they knew food, knew food would be one of them. So then when we were contacted by the local food pantry looking to do a rural distribution, we knew this community and again, these people we could connect them to, they'd have a great level of engagement, involvement, and success. And we can and, act quickly. We can act quickly, which is exciting because when you live in a larger area, as many of us have, um, and you're bogged down with bureaucracy and process and stuff, and not and not the process is imp important, um, but but you know to not have to wait when things are needed you need to act. Yeah. You, you need to make a difference now. People can't wait when they're talking about basic needs or there's these real deep problems. Um, then, you know, when you wait too long, that frustration builds in and then that damages trust. And so it's so exciting for me that, that we're able to act quickly. Um, and, and, and that just makes a world of difference. And, and that's where, you know, you can be crushed by committees, right? You know, that it just, it, it takes too much bureaucracy to get things done sometimes. And again, not all committees are bad, but, you know, sometimes it just slows the process. So you can be a first mover, a quicker responder when you're not only role of connector, but in role of connector, connecting to other connectors and then helping the community. Brian, you used the, the word guinea pig earlier. Um, Jenna, when did this make sense for you? You know, if the canary went into the coal mine and came back out, when, when did you have the aha, this is a good community development model that you want to keep pursuing and, and to be able to communicate that outward to now get up to four different communities doing this? So I think it happened during the during our first heart and soul community, which was Macomb, and they started in 2015 after um, a couple years of conversations with with the Orton Family Foundation um, and the the ten villages that exist around Hancock County. Um, so after a lot of prep and planning, Macomb started in 2015, and in one of the biggest areas that they were focusing on was their their downtown, specifically with their small businesses. Um, and something that we were able to do was connect with the Finley Hancock County Economic Development Group and bring in their director for a conversation with the residents of Macomb. And it wasn't just the business owners, it was the residents who were concerned about the direction of their community, um, wanted to see you know, downtown revitalized. And the fact that we were able to make that connection to bring people together at the table who cared and had that same passion. Um, in my mind, I was like, this, this is heart and soul. This is what it actually boils down to, to see the right people at the table and that we were able to provide the funding to make this conversation happen. Um, and it was just, there was so much energy in the room um, that I can't really describe. It's one of those, you, you had to be there kind of things, but <laughs> It was just such, there was such synergy around everything happening there. It was like, okay, this is what it's meant to be. And, and, and so uh, the energy can be palpable about that. And, and, and you know, what, what uh, Brian, we were talking about this in, in a call before this is, you know, the idea that this isn't, you know, you, you go through a process and then you're done and then move on to the next community that this actually this tool helps create a toolkit for communities that, you know, can be used beyond the lifespan of the phases of the process. And, and Brian, you shared a flow chart with me that I, I just, I, I thought, you know, what, what a great approach to decision-making. Tell, tell me, tell us a little bit more about the flow chart. Right. So we, if you ask each of us in our office, the biggest win um, in a community, you would probably get a different answer from each of us. Um, but one of my favorite wins um, was in Mount Blanchard. And one of the things they realized is that there, there were community members with great ideas. 
but they didn't know how to make them a reality. So the community, the village council came together, I believe as part of their strategic planning process, and they put together, like you mentioned, a flow chart. Uh, that's distributed widely to the community. So looking at what your idea is about, if it's about the parks, if it's about business, is it about you know education, where you start and the process that an idea goes to, goes through, excuse me, to become a reality, which if you think about it, that's a huge win. That's citizen engagement times a hundred. That's you know looking way down the road in 10 or 20 years, that process will have made so many things happen beyond the typical lifespan of heart and soul. Obviously, we hope heart and soul lasts forever in a community, but some of those outputs or some of those wins can really make incredible community change possible. And one of the other things happening in your community that is making change possible that I I just <clears throat> I find absolutely fascinating is the family center uh, that, that the foundation has started. I I want to discuss what it is, why it exists, and and you know how this came to be, you know, modeled after other things, and how this might serve as a model. But a grocery store that you purchased, you renovated it. And now it is an incubator hub collection of nonprofits working out of there. Kimberly, how did this get started? Um, I think all of us remember because of our own probably volunteer days, even before maybe we got into this work, um, going to nonprofits like Chopin Hall, which is a you know basic needs you know organization, or the dental center. You would go buy it, and there was like two parking spots, and you see, but somebody coming out, and they they had like the garb on their mouth or whatever, and they're like, why are they coming out of the building? Oh, they have to move their car in the middle of a procedure. <laughs> you know, it's like very very not ideal situations for our nonprofits, and then obviously then clients of theirs to to have to deal with and. Um, again, as we started to look at um, something special, you know, we wanted to do for, um, you know, one of our, you know, anniversary kind of milestone years here at the foundation, um, you know, this idea of a multi-tenant nonprofit center came up, you know, if we did something like this, what could it look like? And a, a lot of research uh, looking at options and we honed in on what used to be an old grocery store. Um, and again, looking at other communities and how they did that, but I think any, anywhere from 12, 13, uh, 14 nonprofits at any given time are housed together, um, in this facility. Um, and it has just been magic. If I could say one word, it's been magic to see how over time, not only, creating a very professional space for these nonprofits so that they have the dignity and their own work. Um, but then also for the clients coming in, you know, that they can have that dignity and receiving services in a professional environment. Um, that in of itself is just powerful. Um, but the really cool magic of it is that interaction amongst the nonprofits themselves. Um, that synergy, that sharing resources, that saying, okay, and owning, this is my expertise, but I can't do that. But when I sit down and I listen to the needs of this client, and I realize there are many pieces to this puzzle, to this pie. But if I look at the nonprofits in this facility, I know many of them could be addressed in one visit. Brian mentioned, you know, different priority areas. Transportation is, is, is a barrier. Many communities across the country have transportation as, as a barrier. We're no different. So this idea that a, a client or a family can come to one location and receive a variety of needs at one time is amazing. And when we have those nonprofit leaders that are open to figuring out solutions to a family's problems, that is really where it, it, you know, it's cool. Um, I, I love Brian likes to share this story of, you know, a client, you know, coming into uh, one of our nonprofits, cancer patient services. They only serve Hancock County and um, you know, that they, they had, you know, these, this cancer diagnosis, they had a variety of needs. Um, they couldn't get um, some of their work done without um, some dental work taking place first. I, I think this has been incredible for me to learn over the years how, um, 
your, your dental situation is connected to a cancer diagnosis is connected to heart disease. And it's like, wow, all of these different things really have to be considered when it comes to um, providing healthcare, you know, to, to a client. And so that, um, that nonprofit leader at cancer patient services said, okay, we're, we're, we're going to walk you down the hall. We're going to get you hooked up with the dental center. Um, yeah, there's some fees there. Okay. We're going to walk you down the hall the other way to another nonprofit that provides resources for prescriptions for other types of needs that they may have in order to get the dental service that maybe wasn't covered fully. Um, and then we're going to come back and we're going to make sure that your cancer, you know, um, needs are, are met. I mean, how incredible is that to feel truly cared for, to truly um, that you've listened to all to my entire story and that you're going to help fix this for me. You're going to help make these connections for me and get her done before I leave. You're not going to say, oh, you know what? I heard about this nonprofit across town. Why don't you go there next and then maybe come back and then we'll figure it out. It, that's not feasible for these families. No um, bus and no cab needed. Everything exactly. under one roof. Yeah. So that, it's that, really that's your yeah. that's your tagline right there, Jenna. Yep. <laughs> yep. So that dignity and that synergy has been just what I think has really been most meaningful for our community. And and I'm I'm so proud um that this is a kind of a flagship kind of, you know, um program, you know, that the foundation initiated. Well, and it's, how amazing, I'm sorry, how amazing for those community leaders to at that point recognize um the possibility. And, and recognize the, the concerns that all of the nonprofits where they were, but then also recognize the possibility if everyone was co-located. And I think, Kimberly, I love the word magic that you used. There's like, yes, people will co-locate, but then our nonprofit leaders took it to the next level. And mm -hmm. they said, we're not just going to co-locate. We are going to do the best we can to provide that. You hear about wraparound services. That's an example of wraparound in real life and how that synergy, Kimberly, the cancer patient diagnosis mm -hmm. is a great, that's a great example. Another example, eviction prevention. Mm -hmm. um, during COVID, we had several agencies uh, in the same building that could say, okay, I can take care of this piece but I know that this other agency can help with this other piece. So any client that came in, they could visit three places and, and exceed expectations that the client had when they first came in. Yeah. And, and I, I think magic is such an important word of that because it's all working now. But I think if we were to get into the time machine and go back to the beginning, I, I think I might choose risky as, as a word. This seems like some risk to take on that you're purchasing a former grocery store with this vision that you're going to have a hub of nonprofits. How did you have those risky conversations? How did you mitigate the risk and say, we're going to do this? This is why this makes sense, Brian. Well, I think you you use the word risk. Um, I choose to think about hope. So when mm -hmm. you think about the role that foundations have, um, we have the opportunity to sometimes do those experiments um, where it could be, we really think this will work, um, but we're not 100% positive. Let's try it. And then if it works, if we provide a couple of years of funding, then you have the data to show donors that it works. So the nonprofit can then uh, get donors to sustain, st sustain the program. Um, but we see that idea of risk and hope in our work quite a bit. Um, another one of my examples, and Kimberly, I think you'll be able to fill in the details better than I, uh, the idea of high quality pre-K. Um, that idea that the schools, the city and county schools came to us and said, you know, we have this idea that if more young people had enrollment in high quality pre-K, that we would see such a change, such a reduction in interventions during kindergarten, first, second, and third grade, that that reduction in interventions would pay for the high quality pre-K. We just need someone to help us test that theory. And that's a role then the foundation, United Way of Hancock County and other partners could come together uh, to try um, because we, we can try those experiments that are based in good data that we think have a high probability of success, um, sure, there's some inherent risk, 
but also the potential reward is too great not to take seriously. And, and, and Jenna, what is conversations like that? What, what are the conversations like that look like in the community to say, trust us, you know, again, go back to that trust that you've built and that was already built that you're building on. You continue to build, but trust us, we're going to take on pre-K. I mean, that's not a small initiative. What is, what does that look like in dialogue with residents? Yeah, I think going back to we have a history of trust and we have that proven track record. Um, none of this is we don't enter in, don't enter into any of this lightly. There's a lot of footwork that's done. We are always looking at, you know, baselines, other communities, um, and looking forward to realistically what we expect the impact to be. So like Brian said, with pre-K, we expect this to pay off the next number of years in reduced, um, those reduced costs long-term. So when we're talking out to the community, it's it comes back to our mission of, we're going to improve the quality of life for these kids by putting this program into place now that is going to benefit them, but also the entire community in 20, 30 years when they're in the workforce and mm -hmm. we're in a better place. Um, it, it's it's long-term impact and, and these investments that we're making, we know we probably won't see um, the results overnight, typically. Um, just depends on the program, I guess. But a lot of these pre-K and the family center specifically are, and heart and soul, these are long-term programs that are going to have a lasting impact in our community. It's just a matter of making sure we have the right partners on board with us, which because of our history, we're, we're lucky to have those relationships and those connections um, and having the capacity financially to make those happen. And, and sometimes they are new and different. And I think our community trusts us enough to know that we are not going to enter into any uh, program lightly. And, and, and you said over time. And, and, and so, Kimberly, if I went to you and said, if we did a pulse check on the pre-K right now to understand how it's going so far, and then we want to do a follow-up, when do we schedule the follow-up? You know, is it in a year? Is it in five years? Is it in 10? But what's the pulse check now? When do we follow up? So we do constant evaluation. Um, you know, I think the, the beauty of us where maybe again, some other funders um, don't have that luxury is that um, our connection points aren't a six month report um, and then a yearly report. And then maybe, you know, you know, two years down the road, um, we're, we're talking to our partners every single week you know, um, you know, daily. And so we know as it's being implemented, what's going on? Um, how are things going? Are things working? Are things working well? Um, are there some barriers that have come up that we um, need to course correct? Um, I think because of that trust, um, our partners can um, easily pick up the phone and call us and talk to us about that. We want them to. Because at the end of the day, we want right things to happen. We want the good things to happen. And sometimes you can go in with an assumption about what the process is or how it's supposed to work. And it doesn't always happen that way. And so um, because of those relationships, I'm just really you know proud that we can adapt. We can be nimble. We can adjust. You say, okay, well, that didn't work out as we planned. Um, what, you know, what, what were the problems? You know, how do we change this up? You know, how, how do we kind of get this back on track? And so um, these things don't make the, the long-term difference overnight. I like to say that, you know, especially for these more complex um, community issues, it's not going to be solved in a three-year grant cycle. Um, we do need to stay the course, um, but it'll change over time. And sometimes it changes, you know, often. And so we just need to be with our partners, they're with them side by side and figuring it out and adjusting as needed. And for them not to fear communicating that with us, because we, we just want the right things to happen. We understand that that's going to happen. And so we just want to make sure that um, we can figure it out together as we go along. When, and Brian, I think this goes back to something you were saying earlier of, of not to paint this Pollyannish picture of the community, that there are challenges. And mm -hmm. 
it, these challenges didn't happen overnight. So solutions aren't going to amount and undo those overnight. So how do you, how do you sustain that as the the presidency or the leader of the foundation sustain that and say, trust us, it will take time. Well, I think it's when you when you think about uh, these problems didn't appear overnight, solving them isn't going to happen overnight. It's also being really honest and vulnerable when you talk to stakeholders, whether it be with donors, with the, our board, with the community. It's about talking about some of those challenges that our community is facing um, and, and balancing, not making them seem um, unaddressable, but also realizing that we are in this for the long haul. Mm -hmm. And acknowledging there may be bumps in the road, there might be stops in the road, um, in in being really honest about that and vulnerable. Because I think when we think about our organization, we want to be humble and and know that we're part of um, the change, but not necessarily the only ones involved in the change. Uh, but then it's also acknowledging when an experiment doesn't work or mm -hmm. um we thought this would cause this intervention would cause x response but really it caused y response which mm -hmm. was totally out of left field so now we have to talk again about okay with this new reality what what role can we play um, because we still have those big goals those big priority areas but there are surprises in our work um, we talk about those surprises not everything is a win um, while we would love to say everything's a win, there are some things that no matter what you think just didn't work out the way you intended. It's being honest and humble enough and vulnerable enough to admit sometimes things didn't work out. And that's the learning that you have from that can be just as powerful. Think no think risk, no reward. <laughs> right. That That's a great way of framing it. So we talked about one one-stop shop in the family center. That's not your only one. Uh, there's another one-stop shop. It began with a $5,000 investment and has really grown. Uh, now, Kimberly, tell us a bit about Hancock Helps. Yeah, that was so exciting. So a number of years ago, um, we were able to create a community mental health fund um, with a passionate donor in our community. And the very, very first grant that we awarded out of that was a $5,000 grant to a local agency to create this one-stop shop called Hancock Helps. It's a web-based platform. Um, the idea being that regardless of what your uh, need was in the community, you could go to this one site and everything from mental health to, to um uh, housing to support groups to food, um, everything in one spot um, that nonprofit partners could all, you know, input their data in. And uh, again, clients all over the county could, could go to. Um, that has been so cool and it's grown. It continues to grow every single day. Brian mentioned eviction prevention during COVID. One aspect of Hancock Helps that really ramped up was the housing helpline. And it was put in Hancock Helps. And again, this idea, if you're having housing issues, um, you can go there, you can get immediately um, directed to the different clients that are handling the different aspects of the work, whether it be rental assistance or needing utilities or whatever it might be. Um, you didn't have to worry about making, you know, 50 different phone calls. Um, you're going to get uh, a very warm handoff to all of the different clients um, that could assist with that. And that was really built out of Hancock Helps um, during during the uh, pandemic. Um, but it's just it, it, another aspect of it that I think is really cool is that there's trainings with our nonprofits on it. So we continue to figure out ways to make sure that we're serving our clients in the best way possible. So there's a philosophy that we have here in Hancock County called No Wrong Door. And it goes hand in hand with Hancock Helps. And so somebody calls... Um, and the ad admin for a nonprofit answers the phone. And this client tells a story about what's going on in their life. Um, not only might they be directed to Hancock Helps, but they'll, they'll dig a little bit deeper. Okay, what is it that you really need? Okay, well, we don't do that. Um, but, but, but here's five different resources 
Um, and I'm going to give you connections to these, you know, um, so that you get to the right place. You're not going to have to like guess about, you know, where you should go next. We don't do that, but here's exactly where you need to go next to make sure you figure out this for you and your family. And so it's just beautiful to be able to see how that no wrong door philosophy and warm handoffs and that one-stop shop with the Hancock Helps web platform, um, really makes, um, services, um, more accessible, um, and easier to navigate for our residents. And, and Jenna, you had a great tagline one-liner about the the the, the family center. I, I'm not going to ask for a tagline here unless you've got one. But I've got to I've got to imagine that from a communications perspective, this is such a tool to your community to say just go to this one space, and, and there is no wrong door. You're going to find help if you need it. This is where to go. What what has that been like? Right. We're, we're so proud of this project because like Kimberly said, it, it started with um, $5,000 for a, a one-stop shop for mental health. And when you think about the needs and the evolution in our community, um, there are so many other factors that play into mental health, like housing, food security, things like that. So this this platform really grew and changed because of what we heard from the community. And I think that's a great example of the depth of our involvement and why the community placed the trust in us that they do, because we listened, we adapted, we made the change. Um in, in all of that to serve the community. That's not to say like, we're doing this to, to, to show that we're this, we don't have the savior complex. We're not coming in and making this change to say that we did it. It's to make sure that the people who need it get the services that they get. Um, and it, it's another one of those examples of the partnerships that we have in our community that we were able to say to the grantee, we heard this, can we work together to make this change? And, and, and a powerful example of listening to a community, connecting residents with resources. Uh, Brian, Jenna, Kimberly, we've talked so much about the work you do and the impact that you're having. If we had to squeeze it down, like really compress it and distill it down to its essence, one word that comes to your mind uh, in terms of what you hope the community sees the foundation as, if you had to sum it up in just one word out of all the words we've talked about, what do you choose? Brian, let's start with you. This is the toughest question I may answer all day. Um, but I would say, so earlier I talked about partner. Um, and so I would choose the word partner um, because we all do this work with so many other partners, whether they be donors, nonprofits, city, county, federal government. Um, it's all about those partnerships. Jenna, if you had to squeeze it down to one word, what's yours? Uh, like Brian said, probably the hardest question I'm going to yeah. answer today. Um, I'm going to go with um, enduring. So that's our history. Um, the legacies of our donors endure through the foundation. And I think that the impact the foundation has will endure as well. So we've got partners, partner. We've got enduring. Kimberly, what do you choose? Not a lot about this, um, but, you know, when you think about what it is you, you know, your, your legacy, you know, what, what it is that you really day-to-day -day strive for. And I think it's change maker. You know, I, I think um, wanting to be that for a community, um, if I could say a phrase, it's whatever it takes, <laughs> you know, but it's, uh, I, I think being a change maker. So whatever it takes, partner, uh, we've got enduring and change maker brian treese kimberly bash and jenna freed thank you for joining us to talk about the work you all are doing the impact that you're having in your community through the finley hancock county community foundation folks to learn more and to connect with the finley hancock county community foundation visit community-foundation.com and find them on facebook twitter youtube and instagram and to read watch and listen to more reporting on today's story of the american renewal head over to OurTownsFoundation.org and find, follow, and connect with Our Towns on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. For the Our Towns Civic Foundation, I'm Ben Spagan. Thanks for listening and learning with us.